Saturday morning, I had to give the Bhagavatam class at the temple, and then I sat through some long meetings on you know, Alachua land. And uh, most of last week, I was down with 105 fever in the ER, all kinds of weird, and uh, I just got exhausted. I mean, it took an hour before I could you know, gather some energy back and be with you. Uh, if, you're, if you have your cell phones with you, uh, I'm totally in favor of bringing those out because I'm going to send some documents and uh, today is a great day to meditate on those. I just sent a couple of documents for those who are not in the group, maybe you can partner with somebody who's in the group. Uh, these pictures will open only once, you cannot save them, I don't want them to circulate. But the first picture you have is a postcard. Uh, a money order postcard sent from Bhaktivana Thakur to Gaur Kishor Das Dadachi. Mm -hmm. And you can see Gaur Kishor Das Vaira Right? <coughs> For a sum of 125 rupees. You, you see that? Mm. Yeah. And on the other side of the... Are you able to... I opened once, but I closed it, so it's yeah. not opening again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Have it for somebody else. This is the part uh, let me send it one more time on, in the group for the next one. So you see the handwriting of Bhakti Nur Thakur? Mm -hmm. Sending a postcard to Bhakti uh, Gorkishul Das Babaji in 1908. How many years is that now? 1908? Mm -hmm. For 115 years back, these two great acharyas were sending each other money and you know, taking tap and making sure that things are going all right. And did you notice on the other side, the government has a little thing which says, if you are indirect, put your thumb imprint and somebody else signed for Gorkishwar Das Baba. Did you notice that? So I wanted to send that little postcard to leeway into a short discussion on the final pastimes of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And I spent a good 14 years 14 years is a long time, I realize. <laughs> but good 14 years, going from family to family, home to home, wherever I could find a lead. And there was no promise of anything turning up. And so doing research in Bengal means you, you do nishkama karma. You know what that means? You have no guarantee of any result whatsoever. But you have to still be there and you have to still, you know, play football with the little children and take the grandparent generation to the hospital and make sure that if in the parent generation somebody loses a job, you make sure they get a job back and you become family. And after that, they opened up what they had as a family. So everything that I preserved in Gaudiya Vaishnava history, and I didn't plan to, I just, you know, uh, this was Tama Krishna Maharaj's idea, he uh, used me in his service, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, I took a huge risk at Shyam Prasad said, I was about to join the Merchant Navy, because my maternal grandfather was a ship captain, and uh, once you join the Merchant Navy as an Indian, what you do is you get uh, eight months a year, you sail, and you earn in dollars, and you save the entire amount because they are paying for your board and food. And you get to see the world for free, depending on which area you're sailing, and then you come home and rest for four months. Right? Isn't that great? Like, for four months, you get to travel across India, you're a rich man, you know, get the Maharaja treatment. <laughs> and then the rest of the year, you're just sailing. 
right? The seven seas. And Tamar Krishna Maharaj was in my house, and I, you know, he heard what I was trying to do, and you know, his face turned red. <laughs> I said, you know, Gurudev, this is such a great thing to do. You see, my grandfather was a ship captain. All of, many of his brothers are ship captains. Many of my uncles are chief engineers. They have all these good contacts in all these great foreign companies. You know, Indian kids don't get this chance. Mm. Right? And I'm all set. And he said, if you join the Merchant Navy, I'll have nothing to do with you again. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and he was a very strong personality, right? And I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, study humanities. Oh, God. <laughs> I felt this man is impossible. <laughs> First of all, get a little water to drink, please. Oh, yes. First of all, he was in my house arguing with my father on why I should not join the Merchant Navy. You know, he said, if you barely know him, he's already making my career decisions. Said, what, is, what is going on? And the next thing he said is, uh, you must study Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Said, okay. You know, it's for me, okay, fine. Studying Bhaktivinoda Thakur is like maybe study Ben Fenton. I don't know. Wow. What are you thinking? And he said, you know, I have been a monk for 40 years and then I left everything to go to the university. And this is the most important service that Sri Prabhupada would want us to do today for his entire movement. And I'm like, I don't really care about that movement that much. I care about the Sunday feast. <laughs> I care about my friends. I care about, you know, having a great time. But the movement is your responsibility, not mine. How old were you then? I was um, 18. I said, it's like, don't drag me into this. <laughs> and he kept saying that Navadip and Shantipur was the Oxford and Cambridge of Asia. People would come. It was Oxford and Cambridge of Asia, Navadip and Shantipur. These were the centers of learning. Mahaprabhu was a professor of Nyaya and Vyakarana, that is, logic and grammar. Gadadhar Pandit was a professor. Sribas Pandit was a professor. Pandit. Advaita Acharya was a great professor. Right? And in the Mahabharata, when Yudhishthir Maharaj is very thirsty, and I have to tell the story because I was very thirsty. <laughs> very thirsty. Yama comes to him and says, Stop, you have to first answer my questions because all your other brothers are dead. You know the story? Mm -hmm. All your other brothers are dead. And if you drink water without answering these questions, you will die too. And so Yama, his father, starts asking many questions to Yudhishthir Maharaj. And Yudhishthir Maharaj answers them. And one of the questions that he asked was, what is the best form of education? And Yudhishthir Maharaj responded, traveling. So Nityananda Prabhu was the most educated among the Panchatattva. The other four were professors. Mm -hmm. Nityananda Prabhu was not a formal professor. But he was considered the most educated among the others because he was the most traveled. So you see, the Panchatattva were a very highly educated group of people who saw what was happening to Bharat Bhavu. And they dropped everything they were doing because Mahaprabhu had a toad, he had a school, he had a wife, he was maintaining a family. Uh, Srivast Thakur had made quite, a, quite some wealth and he dropped everything. You know, Gadadhar Pandit dropped everything. Advaita Acharya was a professor of philosophy, Advaita Acharya. He was teaching Advaita. He dropped that. And one time when Mahaprabhu found out that he was trying to go back to teaching, Mahaprabhu came there with a stick. He said, I'm going to beat you up. How dare you? So these five professors quit their careers. <laughs> and of the five, Nitananda Prabhu was the considered Adi Guru because he was the one who got the whole thing together. What Mahaprabhu wanted, he knew beforehand because 
this close association with the previous uh, Acharyas. And in this way, the Panchatattva came together, and I'm writing an article on them to come out this fall. Um, I have called it a quintet of divinity. You know what the word quintet means? In Latin, quintet is like trinity, but with five. So Christians have trinity, we have quintet. Right. Um, and I kind of give a very short historical description of how the Panchatattva came together. And what do they mean? Yeah. And we all know the story, so I'm just going to cut to the chase. After Mahaprabhu decided to take sannyas, what was before a regional movement? Because it was in Bengal, right? In Navadri. And when the government authorities were tyrannical, Mahabrabhu, Nitananda Prabhu, Haridas Thakur, they fought not against the government, but for whatever was right. They did not believe that it's us against the government. They believed in people. There are people in the government who are not acting human because of egotistical reasons. And just because they have power, they think they can do anything to the common people and get away with it. And Sri Krishna is Karuna Sindhu Dinabandhu Jagatpati. Dinabandhu means friend of those who are in distress. And so when Sri Mahaprabhu launched his movement, he got, Srila Prabhupada says, the two chief whips of the Sankirtan movement, Nityananda and Haridas. Shuno Shuno Nityananda, Shuno Haridas, Sarvatra Amar Agga Karoho Prakash. Listen Nityananda, listen Haridas, go everywhere and express this decree that I am sharing with you. Shakal Dare Dare Giya Karoe Bhikkha, Balo Krishna Bhara Krishna Karo Krishna Shikha. Go from every door to door, right? Have you seen a door to door campaign during elections? Mahaprabhu was organizing one. Go from door to door, ask people, Bala Krishna, speak about Krishna. Bhaja Krishna, pursue the worship of Krishna. Kara Krishna Shikha, educate yourself about Krishna. So that was the first decree. And of course, you know, Dare Dare means it's a general command, go to every door. But Nitananda Prabhu, who understood Mahaprabhu's heart, whose dwar did he go to, remember? Jagai and Madhai. Because these two people were government authorities. But they maintained their authority with violence. The river Ganga, going from the length and breadth of Navadip, was the source of water for all of its residents. They didn't have pipes like us. Everybody had to go to the river. Now imagine two people who are working as commissioners cut off water access to the city. That's what Jagai Madhai did. And anybody who needed water, he would rape, kill, pillage, you name it. Because how else do they show their authority? And Nithananda Prabhu, who understood Mahaprabhu's heart, first went to them, and Haridas Thakur said, bad idea. Bad, bad idea. He said, Dari Dari, go to every door, but why do you choose the most dangerous doors? <laughs> and Nithananda Prabhu was like, let's try this out. Let's see what happens. And Haridas Thakur said, no, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> and Nithananda Prabhu was like, we'll try. And these two brothers, you know, were drunk all the time. They didn't know day from night, you know, the sun just kept circling and they kept drinking. And uh, one historian tells me that uh, a color sheet for alcohol used to be quite big like a huge, have you seen in India, large 
water pots at five piaus, you know, where they kind of help pilgrims kind of rest, get a little drink before they move on. And the lids are actually quite big, right? So Nityananda Prabhu went and said, you know, he knew the magic, the Krishna magic as Yamuna Devi calls it. Krishna magic. He says, why don't you um, sing with me? Oh, nobody goes to a drunk commissioner and asks them to sing with me. Right? Would you try this if it were a lachua? <laughs> your, your water supply is cut off. <laughs> at, at the root of the problem are these two drunk commissioners. <laughs> and what do you do? You go to them and you ask them, sing with me? It's madness. And initially there was a lot of resistance and they picked up this lid of this earthen pot and smashed Kandita's head. And Haridas Thakur knew that something would go wrong with this man. You know, when we are hurt, in a way, we, it was unexpected. Immediately so many thoughts run in our head on how do we fight for justice, you know? How do we get even? And there is a Bengali drama where they you know, recreated this whole scene. It's a very sweet dialogue. It says, Merecho, merecho, kaloshir kana, taiboli ki prende bona. Just because you have smashed my head with an earthen pot doesn't mean I'm going to stop loving you. Okay? Now, when drunk commissioners hear such kind of stuff in their drunken stupor, first of all, they have no clue what's going on. <laughs> this is something out of the ordinary. Right? Usually they drink, see a few dances, they don't know what happens after that, and then they wake up and they drink again. Right? And a few weeks back I requested Kalakanta Prabhu, why don't you start calling uh, Gainesville Krishna Temple New Birnagar? Because you know, Bhaktivinoda Thakur wanted a campus town in his birthplace, you're a very small town, and think about the, you know, I mean, the, the kids are going to love it, it's Birnagar, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get it now. <laughs> I'm getting my sense of humor, sorry. <laughs> and uh, Jaga and Mada were not on that light alcohol, they were drinking the heavy stuff. And after some time, as the intoxication began to wane, they thought Nityananda's Prabhu sang really well. They didn't know who he was. And, you know, Mahaprabhu came and says, I'm going to kill these two people today. And Nithyananda was like, you know, your job is not to kill. Your job is to change their hearts. Right? And sooner or later, they're going to change. And they did. They did. And after they had transformed, they asked Nithyananda, Prabhu, what can I do? He said, you know, say sorry to every person that you have harassed. Stay on these banks, keep it clean, make sure everybody gets access to water for free. Right? Now that was the first victory. Nobody had thought in their wildest imagination that trying to get two drunk commissioners to sing is going to solve their city water problems. <laughs> Think about it. That's what happened. The next one was the uh, district magistrate, Chandkaji. So music was among band in the city. <coughs> and Mahaprabhu was, you know, um, and singing and dancing in public gathering was banned. Because you know, there were some pockets in which the Delhi Sultanate had a tremendous impact. And so this was against the Shariat, you know Shariat, Islamic, strict Islamic law, mm -hmm. when it's you know, implemented, there's a light version of that law, you know, there's like light and the beta and the turbo versions. And so when there's a turbo version of that law, like in Afghanistan before 2001, there's no music or public gathering, right? And what was Sankirtan movement? Music and public gathering. That's it. And not just, thank you, <laughs> add dancing to that. And so they were doing something that's totally against the law. 
And Srila Prabhupada, yes, I'll come to you. Looking that picture. There you are, right there, yes, exactly. Now here's the here's the fun part. Here's the fun part. Yeah, under no law can you arrest mad people. If somebody declares themselves mad, okay? Today I declare myself mad. What kind of mad are you? I'm mad in love of God. Okay, why don't you do it at home? Is it precisely no? I'm going to be on the streets with hundreds of people singing and dancing. Stop me. That was essentially what Mahaprabhu, Nityananda Prabhu, Advaita, Gadahada, Srivas, and Haridas, and you know, their wives and their children, everybody did. <clears throat> so when the party began in a courtyard like this behind you, Srivas Thakur took the risk. He was a professor, he was very, very respected, he had a lot of money, and Mahaprabhu somehow chose him to be his financer. And what was he financing? Just space and food. He said, Come here. Sing all night. What about the neighbors? We will take care of that. How many of you worry about neighbors? <laughs> Alachua is nice because you, know, you have a lot of devotee neighbors. But even they will not tolerate with that 2 a.m. at night. And Mahabharata will start at 8 a.m. and then go all night. And then sleep for a couple of hours and then wake up. Udilo, Runa, Purobu, Hage, Dijamani, Gora, Amoni, Jage. So at night he would be inside and then morning he would go out. Right. And then suddenly complaints started pouring in. And who were complaining? All the Muslims. The Brahmins were complaining. And there is a scholar called Ashish Nandi, he wrote a great book called The Intimate Enemy. Not about this, but it talks about the principle. And so suddenly when everybody realized what was going on, it's too late. Because the police had come, closed the party down, broke all the musical instruments, and said, this music is banned. Mahabhu said, oh really? By this, his name had spread. And he realized that in his phone book, he at least had 100,000 people. And he had a network because he had already run a door-to-door -door campaign. Think about it. And within a night, he said, there is a protest march. You know, every year there is a month called March. <laughs> March. Protest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and in my grandparents' generation, Mahatma Gandhi utilized the principle of Sankirtan to create something called Salt March that happened around March. And who doesn't know the story of Salt March? Anybody? Yes? Don't know what, what the Salt March? Okay. So the British government had passed a law that Indians could not make salt in their own land. And when salt was made, they had to first pay taxes to the British. Commodity prices were sky high. People were having a tough time meeting their monthly bills. And on top of that, having tax on something as basic as salt, made in your own country from your own ocean. But you're having to ta pay taxes to some, but in some faraway island, who thinks they are your lord? Uh-uh, what happened? So if you look at the original footage of the Salt March, you will see hundreds and thousands of people on the streets singing and dancing, marching to the ocean. Why? To make salt. Why? Because you're going to break the law. This is why Srila Prabhupada says, Mahaprabhu Sankirtan movement is the original civil disobedience movement. Chaitanya Charitam, one of the first things he says. In the beginning of the Bhagavatam also he says. It's the first civil disobedience movement. Right? So, back to the Panchatattva, you know, they said, uh, we are going to sing and dance on the streets, what will you do? And the people outnumbered the police and the security forces, and they were so well behaved. Except some started ransacking Kaji's place, according to Chaitanya Bhagavat. 
वो तो चलते ना चलता हूँ दिस इज इवेंचुअली एवरीथिंग वॉज वेरी पीसफुल एंड द काजी सेड ओके आई सरेंडर द हु वॉज अबाउट द काजी हु वॉज अबाउट द काजी हा नवाब हुसैन शाह He was the king, <coughs> and you know a king cannot function alone. So he had two people with him, and according to one scholar, you know the word sh- sugar. You know sugar, shakar, Malik. You know what the word Malik means. One of the Goswamis is called Shakar Malik before he became a Goswami. Is he a master? Shakar Malik. Malik. Malik means master. Malik means master. Okay. Master. Shakar is. I don't know what Shakar. Sugar. Sugar. Oh, sugar master. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And the other one was called Davi Thas. Davi. Thas is. Thas is. Yogurt. No, 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 and davir in persian means secretary special secretary so one was a sugar master one was a special secretary they were running the empire right and whatever was happening at the level of jagai madhai at the level of chand kazi was ultimately coming from this guy so what did mahaprabhu do he gathered his first it was 100000 when the news spread the number also increased and he started marching towards vrindavan with all these millions of people and circled the village called ramakeli and the sankirtan was going day and night people were just going in circles around the village and the emperor was in that village so at night in the middle of the night Shakar Malik and Dabir Khas came and met Haridas and Nityananda, who were the two chief whips of Mahaprabhu's movement, and said, "What you guys are doing is too dangerous. The emperor is thinking of killing your leader. So Chandra wants to, wants to kill Mahaprabhu, but he was not Mahaprabhu yet. Get out of here right now." Say, Mahaprabhu is too many here. No, please meet. Krishna Chaitanya, new sannyasi. And when they met, when they met, Mahaprabhu somehow convinced them in their heart to give up their government job and join the movement. The very movement the emperor was trying to squash. And he said, "Yes, yes, that will happen. But first, get out of here." This place is too dangerous. And Mahaprabhu said, "What dangerous? Priti bi porjan to jato ache desho gram sharvotto sanchari to hoye mor naam to the farthest extent of every single town and village of this entire planet. These names that I'm singing, and it's a pun. Also, my names will be heard. Don't try stopping me." I said, "No, no, it doesn't work like this. Please, I know you're trying to go to Vrindavan. I will help you." But don't make a scene here," said Okey. So that Ram Kelly campaign was called off, and then Mahaprabhu eventually ended up going to Vrindavan on a very different route. But that particular verse, "Prithvi Porjan to Joto Ache Desho Gram," captured the imagination of someone 400 years later. Why? Because in the 16th century, America was not a known part of Prithvi. Nobody had heard of Americas. Did Mahaprabhu know? Of course, he knows everything. But did the people know? <coughs> And Mahaprabhu is a leader who brings the people to the forefront <coughs> along with him, singing and dancing. Because you cannot arrest mad people. So if you declare, declare yourself mad. Okay, put me in jail. The thing is, imagine if somebody is in jail and they don't feel bad about being in jail, and if somebody is being thrashed and beaten in markets publicly, you know, public flogging, 
How many of you have seen Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of Christ? Do, you, do you recommend it? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's too bloody and gory, but I have to say, that is a professor of world's religions. Uh, <laughs> Uh, kids. I've seen very hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Haridas Thakur, Haridas Thakur was kidnapped and tried to made, make, make an example of. Because Yavana in those days meant Turkish. And he was Yavan Haridas, so he was a Hindu Turk. And Hindus and Turks did not mix because Turks invaded India and they were polluting Hindu culture and you stayed away from the Turks right? they did their own you know, Sufiyama <clears throat> and suddenly you had someone out here who Professor Tony Stewart the great scholar of the history of Gaudiya Vaishnavism he said no his research, his research shows that Haridas Thakur was a Chisti Sufi that Sufism has many traditions. Chisti is one order of Sufism. So Haridas Thakur came from that order of Chisti Sufis. And Chisti Sufis do zikr. Zikr means repetition of the name. Except Haridas Thakur was doing Krishna zikr. And he was totally like a, you know, like a, what do you call it, like outcast. He's not a part of what was regular. And Madhavendra Puri loved him. The Hindus hated him, the Muslims hated him, but the Vaishnavas loved him. Right? And Haridas in his old age was going wherever Mahaprabhu was going. Except when they found out that this man is such a threat, just by his chanting, they said, first, you know, send him a woman. All these Hare Krishna will go out of the window. Check it out. So they got the prettiest, most seductive courtesan of the land. And Haridas was chanting, and you know the story. And he said, you know, let's enjoy tonight, Bhagavad You know, we've chanted enough. We've chanted enough. <laughs> we've chanted enough. Let's enjoy tonight. Take a break. Take a break. <laughs> and Haridas said, just, yeah, yeah, yeah we, we will enjoy, but just let me finish my rounds. That's the trick, by the way. <laughs> you have too many temptations, you tell your mind, yes, I'll do that, but let me first finish my rounds. And then that was the beginning of the transformation of this woman. And she gave up her career, and Haridas said, you just stay in this house, and you chant peacefully. You don't have to go back to that career. So Haridas gave his own house to this woman, he, he figured out who was sending her, and he went on and lived somewhere else. And after that, you know, he was brought to court. He was brought to court. And then at court, he said, you know, you keep thrashing this man in you know, the biggest public markets till he is dead. And how did Haridas Thakur respond? Khanda khanda hai deho jai jodi pran. You put my body into small pieces. And you take my life away. <clears throat> Even then, I will not stop chanting the volumes. But he did not budge. He budge. He did not succumb. He said, you cut me into pieces. You kill me. I will not stop. And so then the flogging started. It was so painful. So, so painful. Right? He was like, they would drag his body on the streets. Right, take to the next market and says, see, if you do this Vaishnava stuff, this is what happens to you. Right? He was and if any of the other Vaishnavas came to his rescue, they would be getting the same treatment. So Mahaprabhu was sitting in Navadi when he heard this news. Right? Advaita, Nityananda, they were all friends of Haridas. So imagine your friend is suddenly arrested by the government and taking, you know, taken from market to market, thrashed like that. And so when they figured that this man is dead, let's do one thing, throw him in the Ganga. So they took his dead body and just threw it in the Ganga because, you know, Muslims get dignity when they are buried. Hindus get dignity when they are burned. You throw somebody's body in the river, that's insult. 
And so they threw his body in the river and after some time he just came back walking alive. And they thought, oh my god, this is a Jinda Peer. Like a possessed Peer. You know what a Peer is in Sufism? So. Huh? So yeah, that's a priest. No, priest. Priest? Yeah, like a guru in Sufism is a Peer. He said, this is like a... This is, this is a special man. Don't touch him. And then Haridas just went peacefully chanting the holy names you know, and everybody was like, like what? <laughs> <laughs> what just happened here? <laughs> and so all of these people, they said that this movement has the potential to solve any great crisis in any generation if it is understood and implemented properly because it is an inside-out process. It's an inside-out process that has very little to do with revolutions, but has everything to, everything to do with solving the problems that causes those revolutions. Right? So in today, every generation has some problem. Like in my grandparent generation, the problem was colonialism. The Prabhupada said, who will listen to your Krishna consciousness if India is not free? And what did Bhakti Siddhanta say? Even if your India is free, your brown English will replace the white English. Wow. And he said this in 1926, 20 years before independence. Who is correct? Was Gandhi correct or Bhakti Siddhanta correct? Looking back. You tell me. Mm -hmm. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta told Srila Prabhupada, this is a revolution which is much bigger than your Gandhi revolution. This, you know, this has been going on since Krishna's time. Just like in Mahaprabhu's time, you had layer after layer, you had uh, uh, Jagai Madhai, you had uh, Chandkazi, then you had Hushensa. In Krishna's time, there was Kamsa, there was Jarasandha, there was Dhritarashtra, so that, you know, chain of command of tyrannical people are always going to be there. Always going to be there. What are you going to do? You're going to fight and get killed? That's, you know, foolishness. But, if you transform yourself in such a way that no matter what they do to you, you are not touched. Even in a jail, you are happy. Let them put you in jail. My grandfather was on an arrest list. <laughs> he was fighting in the Gandhian movement. And they said, you know, this, this man needs to be arrested. So for a few months he ran away, he was hiding in some village somewhere. My father, paternal grandfather, not the ship captain, the other one. And uh, I asked him, how did it feel? He says, not nice. You know. But I did the right thing. He said, you know, whatever happens, I don't know. But I did the right thing. We Vaishnavas must do the right thing. You know, that was a great lesson. He says, don't be afraid of jail. What is jail? They are going to treat you badly. They might starve you. What will they do after that? They are going to try to get some news out of you. They are going to tell you, behave after this. Okay. But that doesn't stop you from doing the right thing. Right? And, and, here is the trick. If you enjoy chanting Hare Krishna, so that it doesn't matter whether you are in your bedroom or your room. It doesn't matter. You, you enjoy chanting Hare Krishna, Krishna speaks to you in your heart. You experience Krishna's presence. After that, death is irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether you are alive or dead. You are transformed. And he says, then nothing can, nobody can do anything to you. This is the Sankirtan movement. It completely inoculates you. And it doesn't matter which part of the world you are in, which time in history, it works just the same. So to do something good for the world, leave it in a better shape than we have found it. With a real transcendental love song on our lips is the highest fulfillment of life. Nobody can question that. But in this Krishna consciousness movement is such a movement that even if somebody is an atheist, that's fine. You don't have to argue with them, let them chant Hare Krishna. And if they don't believe Krishna as God, that's fine too. Let them chant Hare Krishna anyway. Right? How? 
Well, you tell them the story of Krishna. And, uh, you know, Hare is Radha. Sri Krishna could never meet Radha after he left Vrindavan. Why? Because the first person Krishna killed was the main king was Kamsa. And Jarasandha was Kamsa's anybody? Father-in-law. Father so when the father, you know, when the son-in-law is killed, the father-in-law is not going to be happy. So he kept attacking Krishna's kingdom again and again and again. Who was the emperor above Jarasandha? Yudhishthir, Bhim, Arjun, Nakul, Sahaja, they were kicked out, right? Right after Krishna killed Kamsa, he received a letter from Kunti saying, you know, we are in distress, our family is trying to kill us, please come and protect us. And Krishna jumps to the rescue of the Pandavas. But who is trying to kill the Pandavas? Yeah, Dhritarashtra is on the throne, he wants Duryodhana again. So that chain of command of corruption was there at that time also. And because Vrindavan is very dear to Krishna, it would have taken one day for any of these big kings to completely burn and destroy Vrindavan to the ground. Right? And Krishna was going all over India, making alliances, kings, trying to put Yudhishthira Maharaj on the throne. But he knew that his village was under threat from Kamsa, uh, from uh, Jarasandha and the high ups. And Jarasandha attacked Mathura how many times? 17. 18 times he was destroyed, right? 17 times. So if you think that Krishna was always standing and playing the flute, you know, think again. Krishna was dealing with some serious, you know, attacks going on, on his people, right? at his time. And uh, he was, by all means, always thinking about how is Radha doing, how is Vrindavan, how is Nanda Yashoda, how are all my little friends? Even though he was the biggest king, maker, eventually of his time, that he, the biggest emperor, Yudhishthira Maharaj, in you know, his Adhesuya, paid homage to Krishna. But Krishna never took that very seriously. He just went back to Dwarka and you know, started living his own life. But, but the fact remains that in Krishna's lifetime, Krishna had to use the force of power. In Mahaprabhu's lifetime, when the great scholars saw what Mahaprabhu was doing and realized that this individual is doing the exact same work as Sri Krishna, except this time, he is not using the force of power, he is using the force of love. Therefore they came and said, Mahaprabhu is Krishna himself. That's the logical reasoning. And when Bhaktivinoda Thakur read through all of that and realized that, you know, as Kali Yoga progresses, we are becoming a small global village. That means, the good things that can be shared around the world are being shared. But it also means that all of the bad stuff that is happening in other people's countries are also going to come here. Right? We are right now on Native American land. Think about it. This was either stolen from them, by force, by manipulation, by deceit. Right? And most of them wiped out because of the diseases that they couldn't handle that came from Europe. So this was one instance of mass genocide. And there are so many of them happening around the world. These things are going to increase. What can we put into place so that societies of the future are not going to suffer this kind of, you know, <coughs> deadly events? And this is why Bhaktivinoda Thakur felt that Mahabharata's prediction to the farthest extent of every town and village in this world, my names will be heard. He felt that if that were true, then so many lives would be saved. So much good would happen that one day, when people recognize the genius of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they will come to Navadip for a pilgrimage and chant Jai Satinandan. When will that day 
when my brothers from Russia, Prussia, England, Africa will come together and join hands and sing Jai Sachinandan. Remember what Bhaktivinoda Thakur said? Because of this reason. And for that, he realized that the intellectuals of every country needs to understand what the Sankirtan movement is because Marxism was growing and so was capitalism by his time. Adam Smith had written a book called The Wealth of Nations and Karl Marx had written his books and both were becoming very, very prominent. And he realized that these people are missing out on the good stuff because Mahaprabhu's works are in Sanskrit and Bangla language these people don't understand. What do we need to do? Translate books. Send it to the universities. Let the leaders and thinkers of society realize what this movement is. And among those who have some fire in their belly, they're going to pick this up. They're going to turn this into a movement. Right. For this purpose, he sent, he kept working tirelessly and sent his books across universities. And he told Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, and I'll conclude with this. He said that, I have three requests. Right? And today morning I gave a class on the last letter from Bhakti Vinod Thakur to Bhakti Siddhanta. It's on record on the temple uh, YouTube, I guess. He says three things. First, in the name of the movement, a lot of unscrupulous people are pretending to be ascetics and renounced people, but are taking advantage of innocent congregational members, especially women and children. Please reform the ascetic order. You are already a brahmachari. Please make sure that vairagis, those who call themselves vairagis, they are not cheetahs. Please. Otherwise, the good reputation... So these are three instructions, Bhakti Thakur to Bhakti Yes. Make sure that those who are claiming to be renunciates are not hypocrites. It's very crucial because then the entire good reputation of your movement is going to go. People are not going to trust you. And what did he do himself? He took Babaji initiation. You know what Babaji initiation is? This is above sannyas. And he took Babaji initiation and went back to his wife and children. Wow. Okay, so first be honest. Babaji doesn't mean suddenly you're growing two wings. You know. First become a person with integrity. Go home. He was sitting and chanting. He says, Babaji means I have nothing to do with material world. That doesn't mean absence or presence of former family. Mm. They're all Krishna's children. Mm. What's wrong with you? Why are you giving up your family, right, to get real estate in a holy place so that you can run your business? What kind of a Babaji are you? The first instruction, reform the ascetic order. Second instruction was take care of Mayapur. My Bhaktivinoda Thakur really loved Sridhar Mahapur. And he put a lot of effort into identifying the original birthplace of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He said, this should become the capital of Kirtan. Right? He envisioned that. And third is, Prithibi Parjanta Jato Ache Deshogran. To the furthest extent of the world, these names will be chanted, this heard. Make that happen take the movement, make it global. So Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasri Thakur took those three, instruct three instructions very, very seriously. And because of that, we are here today. Think about it. Because of that, we still respect our sannyasis. Because there was nothing called sannyas, and I wrote an article called Experimentations with Sannyas in Gaudiya Vaishnavism. And Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur literally designed the, uh, the fashion appearance of Sanyasi Zira. He was the one who made the stick and wrapped it out. And he did it based on research, but he was the one who made it. And so some people who don't understand the broader significance of the movement say, oh, this is all new and made up and not bona fide. That's not true. There is a big reason why, you know, Bhakti Siddhanta did it. Hmm? Um, and, you know, we are a global movement right now, 
we've come that far. But there are some steps remaining. Bhaktivana Thakur wrote very well in English, but he realized that unless he spoke to his own people first, nobody would take him seriously. So he wrote all his books in Bangla and Sanskrit. But he really wanted these books to be translated into every language of the world. And this was one of the parting wishes of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Avashila Prabhupada, Bhakti Pramod Puri Maharaj, somehow this instruction has not been completed. I am struggling. If anybody here you know, is interested in this, let me know. This is uh, a mandate from our Acharyas that has left unfulfilled over many generations. Collected works of Bhakti Vinod Thakur translated in as many languages of the world as possible, available to people to read and understand what this movement is about. Right? Marxism did not spread till all the books were translated. So this is a very, very critical service. Right? The second, he wanted to establish the worship of gold Vishnu Priya. Have you heard of this before? I have. And uh, I have a little picture of um, Gaur Vishnupriya that he had personally um, had carved and he worshipped and these are the original deities of Mayapur. Are you you want to hand that around? Pass I want, yeah, but it's going to close. You so can take the phone it. and pass it around. I'll just send it in the group. Oh, okay, yeah. Let me uh, send it in the group quickly. It's a beautiful picture. Uh, You'll get darshan only once, huh? Jhalak darshan. <laughs> because I'm putting it in a book cover and I need to save it. So don't spread it around. Maybe. Please don't spread it around. Yeah. But in this picture you will notice Mahaprabhu and Vishnu Priya holding hands. And he put this picture in the sanctum sanctorum of the main temple that he created called Yoga Peet. Have you heard of Yoga Peet? Because back in the day, much before Vivekananda, before Yogananda, before yoga even was a thing, Bhaktivana Thakur envisioned a global yoga movement. And he felt that Gaur Vishnu Priya should be the highest exemplars of that yoga. Gaur Vishnu Priya is the highest exemplars of yoga. Why? Because Mahaprabhu leaves everything, including his wife, and makes her the leader of the Sankirtan movement in Navadri. Think about this. A 16-year-old girl took charge of the entire movement. Mahaprabhu said, you take care of this movement in Navadri, I'm going to Puri. Now, it's time to break the news. Yeah. <laughs> now it's time to break the news. This is not how you have ever heard of the Sankirtan movement, but I'm going to say it anyway. Back in the day, there was nothing called newspapers. How did news spread? A small group of people would go from village to village, beat their kartals and drums, gather everybody, and share what the king said. Mahaprabhu captured the news media of his time. Wow. Think about it. Mahaprabhu captured the news media of his time because Milanga's Kartals was the news media. And he arranged it in such a way that everybody hears the news. And what was the real news? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Why is it news? Why is it news that when Krishna is fighting, one after the Krishna's life was not easy. Born in jail, grows up to hear parents are arrested somewhere else. These are my foster parents, they love me but they didn't know. You know, goes, either you die or you live. And you know, you, Krishna, the, that's what comes arranged for him. You fight, you have to kill your own uncle. And after killing your uncle, you have made the most powerful enemies in the country. <laughs> and now, your best friends are hiding in the jungle who are the real kings, and to be able to put the best among them on the throne, you are going here and there and making alliances, and you're still trying to keep peace, right? And what do they do when you're trying to keep peace? They arrest you. What did Duryodhan do to Krishna? Krishna came to Hastinapur to say, 
let's have peace, brothers should not fight like this. What's the first thing? They put him in jail. Krishna, have you any clue what you're doing? And he said, not land held at the tip of a needle without a war. That's what he was told. If you want a war, what can I do? Now, he was very smart. And my teacher, Narasimhachari, he taught me to think about Bhagavata and Mahabharata in a certain way. He says, Krishna split between himself and his army and said, two sides are fighting, I cannot take sides, both are my cousins. Balaram said, I have nothing to do with this war and he left for pilgrimage. And what did Krishna do? He said, I will become a driver on one side and my army will go to the other side. And if you think about it, Krishna's army would never hurt Krishna. So if the army was on the other side, it's called a win-win situation. <laughs> so whatever happens in the war, Krishna will win. Right? Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna, Yatra Partha, Dhanurdharaha, Tatra, Vijaya, Sri, Bhuti. Wherever there is Krishna, the Lord of Yoga, Yatra Partha, where is Arjuna, the wielder, the action man. There, Vijaya, victory, Sri, abundance, Bhuti, powers. Dhruva Niti, Dhruva means unshakable law. Niti, Matir Mama says, Sanjay, this is, according to my opinion, unshakable law that wherever Krishna is there and he has this action man with him, victory is guaranteed. Right? So Krishna <coughs> walked into the situation like that. And what was Krishna doing in the middle of the battlefield? He was teaching about yoga. What was Mahaprabhu doing in the middle of the Sankirtan movement? He was teaching about yoga. What did Bhaktivinoda Thakur do for the whole world? He said, this is the capital of Kirtan and the main temple shall be called Yoga Pit. It is about yoga. Now in America, yoga is a 36 billion dollar industry. They're doing all kinds of you know, contortions, this, that, you know, selling Lululemon. Uh, <laughs> nothing against Lululemon. But the real point of yoga is lost. So it is each and every one of our responsibility to make sure we understand what Bhaktivinoda Thakur has in mind when he talks about yoga. And we may know it or not know it, but we are actually practicing it. But better to be aware. And help this great ancient movement of yoga, which has always protected what is good, what is right, and the sanctity of life overall, right? So this is not a sectarian movement, therefore. You know, people tend to think, oh, this is a religious thing. Oh, Krishna is a Hindu god. Well, you know, uh, the gator is a Yankee god. You see this crocodile everywhere in Gainesville. You know, if, if the word Yankee in America means American. Right? But it's a slang. Similarly, the word Hindu means anybody who is from the other side of the Sindhu river. It's a slang. But Hindus don't know that. So for hundreds of years, they just call themselves Hindu. It's a foreign word. You see what I'm saying? Right? And so, it is not a religious movement per se. It has a deep existential metaphysical and a psychological dimension. If you really look at Krishna consciousness, it is a composite <coughs> science. And I've recently written an essay called The Subjective Science of Divine Emotions. We humans experience mundane emotions all the time. But from time to time, we have a flash of divine emotions. We don't know where it is coming from because we don't know the science. So Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, my summary of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu is, it is a subjective science, right? Objective science means happening in the world outside, subjective means happening in the world inside. It's a subjective science, there is a hypothesis. You can design experiments, you can see results. Those experiments can be repeated and you will get the same results. That's why it's a science. And three weeks back, I was with a professor from Stanford 
from the psychiatric department. I said, you know, the Buddhists have come up with mindfulness. And if you look at Google Scholar, you will see 250,000 papers, research papers written on just mindfulness, supporting the Buddhist ideology. You look at what we are doing, there's barely anything. There are 2,000 journals, academic journals for Christianity. There are about five journals for Hinduism, one for Vaishnavism. That too we struggle to maintain. So if this is the situation in our current generation, we are not trying our best. Right? So my appeal to you is to see how whatever you are doing can be dovetailed into the bigger picture. Right? And I want to conclude by saying that on the English birthday of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, which is 2nd September, I am looking to hold a 42-hour Sharanagati experience at the Gainesville Retreat Center. So, in 42 hours, we'll go through all the songs of Sharanagati. We look at the original manuscript, and I've designed some exercises around them. So we sing, we reflect, we learn from each other, move on. There are only 25 spots. That's what the retreat center will allow us. And I said, sure. So it's a very special birthday weekend immersion. Right. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, drop me a line saying interested in the group, and I'll send you the link to register. And I'll stop here. I hope what I shared with you today makes sense. The Sankirtan movement is clearer in your head, and you're more inspired to do something. Uh, look at your own circumstance, look at what Mahaprabhu did for us, what Krishna did for us, what Bhaktivinoda Thakur did for us, and what Srila Prabhupada did for us. His city was being bombed in the 40s during the Second World War. And what was his thinking? How can I spread the message of peace in the most important country in all of this war? Because in the war, there were the Axis powers and the Allies, right? The United States, then UK. Huh? Great Britain, who else were on this side? And Russia, on the other side it was Germany, Japan, and they were fighting. And the Japanese were bombing Calcutta. You know this? Like why would the Japanese bomb Calcutta? My grandfather was there. And the Japanese were bombing Calcutta because it was British territory. <laughs> and the entire British army was made up of Indians. Oh my God. And Shumas Chandra Bose was getting on the radio and telling the Indian uh, soldiers in the British army to defect. And they were defecting. He says, why are you fighting with the British? This is your motherland. You join me in Rangoon, we will just march back and take our country back. Right? And they thought it's a great idea. <laughs> and in the meanwhile, the Japanese are still, you know, dropping bombs on Calcutta to destroy the marketplaces and the bridges. And the Bengalis write poetry about everything. And so when I, we were little kids, we were taught a little nursery rhyme. We were taught a the Japanese are bombing. <laughs> so we were singing that, and only after I studied Indian history, it's like, uh oh. <laughs> it's serious business. <laughs> and so Srila Prabhupada was in the middle of all of that, and some reporter asked him, What would you do if you were dying? He said, I was just peacefully flying, frying kachoris. For Radha Govinda. And you know, if a bomb drops in my house and I'm supposed to go, I'm supposed to go. What can I do about it? You know, people are so afraid of their deaths. You know, pure devotees are surrendered. But he knew that in all of this, America emerged to be the greatest superpower. New York was the most important place. It was off limits for Asians because of the Asian Exclusion Act which was repealed in 1965, which was the first moment Prabhupada said, okay, now let's go, time is right. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
Before that, everybody kept trying. Nobody could come. And he was trying too. And the law was just against him. And what would he do? He would sit with a janda outside the US consulate protesting? No. He was sitting in Vrindavan, writing his Srimad Bhagavatam. And what was he saying? We must understand the present need of human society. We are no longer bound by these geographical walls and have made a tremendous amount of progress in the areas of economic development, of modern education, of sense gratification. And despite all this progress, there are large scale quarrels because there is a pinprick somewhere. And there is a need of a clue as to how we can exist in peace and prosperity. And Srimad Bhagavatam is a cultural presentation offering that clue. That is what Srila Prabhupada says. It's in the it's in the forward uh, of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Right? And the next thing he did was present Bhaktivinoda Thakur's summary of the life of Chaitanya. He said, This is the most exemplary teacher of the Srimad Bhagavatam. We cannot understand the Bhagavatam unless we understand this teacher. And then he starts Janmadya Sayyataha and then he continued. Right? So he was very clear in his head what the Srimad Bhagavatam can do. Why Mahaprabhu did it. Now it's up to us, our generation. We have taken it up, right? We must take it forward and fulfill it and execute it. And if we do that, I can guarantee as a historian based on my study of history, not anything else, at least a million dollars that I don't have, that this thing works. It has worked time and time again in history of the last thousand years. There are too many case studies of success, right, to suggest anything otherwise, right. With this, I want to stop today and open up for any comments, corrections, questions, realizations, and then we'll call it a day. And we'll sing Jaya Nila Premonha and yes. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Always nice to see you and hear your voice. I appreciate how you gave us a historical slash political view of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission mm. and Bhakti Nautakwa's understanding of that further. Than. Are there any works of our charge of Bhakti Nautakwa that are like Pull together these ideas of the political manifesto. No, the Srimad Bhagavatam is the thing, even in Bhaktivinoda Thakur generation. Uh, Bhagavat Arkamariti Mala is a great way of getting the substance of the Bhagavatam. Then there are articles that he wrote uh, that are political in nature. He was a champion of women's education at a time when women were not allowed to be educated in India. And so he wrote many articles on that, and then he kept Shastra separate as a Pramana Mala, like a garland of evidences. Right. But there isn't anything like that. Maybe some devotee should compile. Like context and you know, like historic because sometimes when we read these books, we don't read them in historical context, and therefore we don't get the full picture. And the authors of these books don't provide historical context because you know that would be extraneous. There are other books you can read to get the historical context, but we don't have the time. And so I set aside time to do this work because this is so critical, if you think about it, to understand who we are. If you don't study, you know, 5th century BC Palestine, you don't understand Jesus Christ. You have to know what is Roman Empire to understand Jesus. If you don't understand the political map of India during Krishna's time, you don't understand Krishna. Right, And then what Krishna, of course, is transcendental that you can understand Krishna no matter what, but it's not a complete you know, understanding. Krishna himself refers to history, so history is important. Right? And somebody should do it. Maybe some, somebody can enroll to the, you know, in the IVS program and we will sit down and work on it. You know? But uh, academic universities will not pay for it. 
Mm. And if our movement doesn't pay for it, who will? Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? Otherwise, we'll sing K and look at one hundred. Yes. Um, I have two questions. Um, so the first question. Now I can't forget. The, I forgot the second question. So the first question. You mentioned how um, the media during that time and place was. Um, Going by hand, just going walking by walking. Yeah, they would go to a village and generally they doing market and everybody would gather. Yeah. Listen, listen, listen. Right, and so that that was the process. Yeah, for disseminating news, and well, Chaitanya, you know, he used that same method for preaching. Yeah. So does that mean we should examine what is are the current media? You know, what is our form of media today and do the same thing? Look at Raghunath and uh, Kaustubha. What are they doing? It's podcast. That's what people listen to. Right? Uh, but there is more to that. If you look at uh, how the media works, <laughs> there's a great book called Trust Me Online <laughs> <laughs> by uh, this author called um, Ryan Holiday, who lives in Austin, Texas. Yeah. And he was, uh, for decades, a media manipulator. And then he came and explained how the media works. Right? If you read that book, it's an eye-opener. There's nine great points. Um, and, but and you're absolutely right. I mean, in last year when we spoke about some of this, these ideas, I said, you know, the first thing we need to do is set up YouTube studios. Mm. We really need to get people talking about these issues. And we need to be on YouTube, we need to be on Instagram. That's where things are happening. But that's where people's attentions are. And if we don't plant these messages on these forums, then, you know, we are imitating a great movement, but we're not fulfilling its purpose. Oh, yeah, if you have the external forums, you know, you're wearing Dhoti Gurdha Tilak. That's the uniform of the Sankirtan movement. Right, but if you don't go that extra mile and figure out, oh, this is the purpose, right, right? and think about it, there is so much we, we should do, not we can do, we should do, based on all the knowledge we are sitting on and all the resources we have. 3,000 people in this area who are dedicated to Krishna, and that's like, you know, uh, such a gift. But if we don't fulfill our potential as 3,000, well, you know, what can 3,000 people do? I mean, Alachua County can become America's first Krishna conscious county. Mm. Think about it. We have that potential. Right? It's just that we haven't come together to think with each other and join forces and figure out how we can make it happen. Mm. What Mahaprabhu's generation, Nityananda Prabhu and Haridas Thakur did, that's the difference. And Acharya is somebody who teaches by example. Our Acharya is a teaching by example. We should follow that example. Simple. So not necessarily following the external forms of the principle. The principle is you use, the Yukta Vairagya principle. Yeah, Yukta Vairagya means, you know, it's a, it's a state of mind where you... In other know, words, in that time and place, singing and you know, going from top to so Singing and sing, singing itself has still tremendous power. I mean, what do you... S you know, during the civil rights movement in this country, what were people doing? They were singing, we shall overcome. And marching to Washington. You know, the best kirtan program I've experienced in my life, that I've led, was before the 2016 elections. Because nobody had imagined an America with Donald Trump as president. Not the people who were voting for him, not the people who were voting against him. And I was in Chicago. And uh, I did a program, and there is an article you can look up called, um, if you look at Yoga Chicago Abhi Ghosh uh, on the internet, you will find a summary of my lecture. And I called Ranak Maharaj the night before, and I said, I'm doing this very big program, what do you want me to do? And we had a long conversation, and the summary of that conversation is there in the form of that article. But during that program, I basically told the story of Chandkazi and Martin Luther King Jr. And we sang, we shall overcome and Hare Krishna together for the first time in my years of Western outreach. 
I saw people crying to the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. For the first time, they felt the mantra. They realized what it was. Right? So we have to meet people where they're at. Mahaprabhu did that, Krishna did that, everybody did that. So to understand okay, how the media works today, what are the challenges we are facing, what are the principles of the Sankirtan movement that can be used in this context? How do we get out of this you know, petty mind, mind, you know, mindset of looking at other people's faults and see what are their good qualities and how can those be used in the Sankirtan movement? Then the social problems that we are facing will disappear. You know, whether Jiva fell from the sky or from whatever. You know, pe people look, Bhakti Siddhanta Sharsil Thakur was very clear about one thing. You know, flies will go towards excreta. Hmm? Uh, bees will go towards nectar. So, you know, in this field, if you have a you know, dog poop, say, right, the butterflies will ignore that. It will go to the nectar. And those who are flies will ignore the nectar and go to the... So those who are just seeking controversy, they are delaying the purpose of the movement. And one of the reasons, and I know I'm on record, I'll say this anyway. <laughs> one of the reasons I had resigned from the Shastrik Advisory Committee. I, of course, my health was a major reason. But I was losing my health, worrying about... You know, if the best brains of the entire movement are brought together to discuss whether you should eat with your right hand or your left hand, <laughs> and whether husbands can meet your wives, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> seriously, you know, there is climate crisis going on. There is wage gap. We need nuclear disarmament yesterday. This planet can be nuked at 40 times over with the amount of weapons we are holding. And you look at the Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th canto, 1st chapter, verse I think 13 on. Once upon a time the earth was overburdened by kings who were armed to the teeth, ready to strike at each other at the slightest provocation. That's how the Krishna book starts. Aren't we there today now? What are we doing? You know, we're so so busy because any, you know, like a flick of a button, so many jobs will disappear. With AI, the bloodbath hasn't even started. Most of the IT jobs that we have, they're not going to be there. You know, does anybody work in telephone exchange anymore? No. Does anybody play Atari? That company closed down. So if you do not keep up with the times, you are going to be left behind. And we cannot let that happen. This Sankirtan movement should be at the forefront, mm -hmm. leading the way. Bhakti Siddhanta Swarashti Thakur was saying, you know, go to the busiest places in the most urban centers and establish this. You cannot just retreat to the woods. Hmm? Take what is the, you know, why was Sarasthi Thakur so obsessed with dioramas? Because he wanted all these abstract principles to, show, to be shown in 3D. Right? For years and years and years, I'm saying that, you know, instead of spending millions of dollars on, you know, chandeliers, use something like, uh, uh, you know, hologram technology. It's cheaper, you can modify it. And it serves the purpose. Sarasthi Thakur was saying, put it in 3D. Let people experience it. And so my constant meditation is like that. If Nityananda Prabhu was here in June 2023, traveling across the United States, what would he do? Do you think if all our Acharyas saw the potential of Walt Disney, they wouldn't want something like that? Don't we have the characters in the Srimad Bhagavatam to make something better than Disney? For God's sake, Mickey Mouse is made up. <laughs> we have much better characters. Hanuman is so much more inspirational than Mickey Mouse, I tell you. And American kids don't know about Hanuman. 
even if you think of it as simple business, so much can be done. So much can be done. So I, I really bank on the younger generation. You know, at least they will not spend years thinking, you know, left hand or right hand that you look in the sky. You know, wherever you came from, for God's sake, now we are here, Krishna put you here, engage. Uh, do you, am I making sense? I hope I'm not too controversial. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know how I got here, why I'm doing this. You know, it's just, uh, I just think this is the right thing to do. I'm the, probably the least qualified to be saying these things. As I told, my mine was joining Merchant Navy. It was TKG who got me into this thing. And the night before he passed away, <clears throat> he spoke with Dwaranath Maharaj for eight hours. It's just dumping his heart. And I was there with Dwaranath Maharaj and Radhanath Maharaj. He was very yeah, much younger. And then one of the things he pointed to, which many years later I found in Bhaktivinoda Thakur, was that Navadip and Shantipur were the Oxford and Cambridge of Asia. He was doing his PhD from Cambridge and he was living in Oxford. And he was saying, I'm doing this so that I can come back and work towards that goal. Right? And Krishna Vishek, I want you to help me. And of course, at that point, I didn't know what that meant. He said, you should go abroad, you study this tradition very nicely, study Bhaktivinoda Thakur, engage in interfaith, and you come back and you help me build this. And so what do you want? He said, I want at least a graduate research center in Calcutta and a campus near Mayapur, far away from the pilgrims. And we should have a world-class university, and many more, but a world-class university where the core curriculum has to be Krishna conscious. And then we get faculty to teach all kinds of stuff so that people can get jobs. Right? But they will carry their Krishna consciousness with them in their jobs. And in that way, they will become exemplary teachers or acharyas. And so when I shared this vision with Jayapataka Maharaj, he said, yes, correct, Prabhupada wanted this too. And Prabhupada told us, we should have an establishment that can graduate 10,000 acharyas a year. 10,000 acharyas, it's like, you know, we are, we should now in debate whether they should be men or women. Only get 5,000. No, are we going to debate about that? It's very clear. Prabhupada wants 10,000 acharyas. He's looking at a big plan. <laughs> He's looking at teachers who can train this idea, you know, who can live exemplary lives. And in their careers, set a great example of what it means to be Krishna conscious. And we're already doing that default. Like, you know, Ganeshram. You know, it's established. Right? And so in his career, he's giving the example of how to be Krishna conscious and still do your stuff in the world. Like Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So that's an Acharya. This is the future of Acharya, right? And as we carry that message within our heart, and if we have some fire in our belly, and we understand the big picture, this is so powerful, nothing can stop us. And then we have to see avenues where we can use media, we can use finances, we can use management and logistics for this one goal, one purpose, you know? The Sankirtan movement. Krishna Varanam Tisha Krishna, Shango Pangastra Parshata, Yadgai Shankirtana Prayer, Yajanti Hi Shu Medha Sha. If you're intelligent, Su Medha. If you're intelligent, you'll get the point. Huh? Was I able to answer your question, Bhu? One more question. So, do you have, in your, in, in over the years, have you um, guided devotees? and kind of give them ideas on how they can do Krishna consciousness in their workplace? Absolutely. With, with I do this all the time. Okay. I, this is what I do, except I have not done that much with ISKCON devotees, only when they have come to me. But, you know, as an academic advisor at a university, I see. I, see, I am constantly teaching subjects where I can share Krishna consciousness. I have not talked much otherwise. Because to me, my, the goal is very clear. You know, I did not come to the West to get a job and settle down. And my mother still complains, when are you going to get a job? You know. 
<laughs> and I tell her that someone on a mission cannot have a job. <laughs> you can get a job for the mission, which I did. You know, I was I needed to prove myself. So I got a tenure track position, which is very rare to come. I got a unanimous yes vote at the end of six years, which is the best a professor can get in this country. And then I said, thank you very much. Here's your job back. Right. In my grandfather's generation, he, he returned his degree. He said, thank you very much. I have got me your education. Here's your degree back. Right. So I don't need certificates from Western universities. I've proven myself. And then I took on IVS because you know, some senior devotees like Ravindran Sarupuru, Garuda Prabhu, you know, many, many others, they felt after the BI was made, there wasn't much space for doing humanities and social sciences, which our movement desperately needs. And it is a humanistic movement. And so they made the IVS. And Srila Prabhupada, I heard, and I've seen some evidence, was trying very hard to retire and go and get a faculty position at GTU in Berkeley. Because his friend, Dr. Stilson Judah, with whom he had many, many conversations, gave him a faculty position and said, you're doing such important work. Why don't you come to GTU, stay in Berkeley, just finish your books. And the movement is already there, it will spread. And Srila Prabhupada gave that very serious consideration, except he just couldn't retire because, you know, every time he tried, there was so much managerial drama, he had to get involved with this one. Right? But he was really looking forward to being there and establishing this process of writing hushes and he had a list of books he wanted to write commentaries on. Right? So that work is very important and IVS is doing that work and for a few years the IVS was at the GTU which like Srila Prabhupada wanted but it's a lot of money and as a movement we are not ready. But uh, we are doing that here, I mean after I came and I took it on we received permission from the Department of Education, Florida to grant our own religious degrees. And so immediately I started the master's program and I'm waiting for the first batch of master's candidates to graduate so we can get them into a demon, you know, a doctor of ministry. So I want, I, I, it was always my idea to create PhDs in preaching. Mm -hmm. We need to have PhDs of, you know, preacher PhDs, mm -hmm. right? Who, who know what preaching, what preaching in this world actually looks like. Learn from the best of Christian preaching, right? Best of secular humanistic preaching. Uh, all right, I don't know what time it is. And I'm clock off 7 p.m. No, 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 4.34. 4.34, okay. Should we sing Jayami no Pradhan in honor of Bhaktivinoda Thakur's disappearance and then yes. call it a... Jayani lo premodhano Guru na prachu Jayani lo
evoke a sense of deep gratitude towards our teachers who have selflessly been there for us and have helped us to steps on the path of this. There are mothers, our fathers, our best friends. They chastise us. They look out for us. And no matter what they do, we know that real teachers love us at the end of the day. The loss of a teacher is a great, great loss. Narutam Thakur says that I miss them so much I wish I could smash my head on rocks and I could just enter fire and get done with life. Oh, uh-huh. 
Kishore Prabhu for chasing me and making this program happen. And thank you. Who are the hosts tonight? They're not here. They're not here. They're actually, it was amazing. She, no, she was, I, she was so enthusiastic. So she would have to do the program here in our house, even though they're not in town. So then Kujava is the boss. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I'm going to be here for some more time. Yes. Take prasad if you have other things. Welcome. But I'm, you know, if you have any ideas for me. Oh, yeah, I Actually, I should say, Ratu Manjari Mataji, she's the host. She's the closest to the host. <laughs> she, is, she lives here also. Here in <laughs> so you're the transcendental via medium. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. His Grace Krishna Vishay Kabuki! Yeah. Yeah.